Welcome to the Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Kathleen Carley, who is a professor in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. She is the director of both the Center for Computational Analysis of Social and Organizational Systems, or CASOS, as well as the Informed Democracy and Social Cybersecurity, or IDEAS Center a university-wide interdisciplinary center that brings together network analysis, computer science, and organization science. Kathleen Carley, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Uh, thank you, and love to be here. Could you please give our audience a little bit more background about KSOS and IDEAS and your work at Carnegie Mellon? Sure, so both of these centers are computational social science centers um, and kind of come out of the fact that I have both a sociology degree, but am very steeped in artificial intelligence and so on. And where KSOS focuses on developing new computational social science techniques, uh, employing network science, simulation, machine learning to address complex problems like organizational design, public health issues, counterterrorism, ideas, which is the Informed Democracy Center, is focused on bringing together at uh, the university level, computer scientists, social scientists, policy analysts uh, to address issues of disinformation, hate speech and extremism online. Fantastic. So the conversation I'd like to have with you today is about uh, social cybersecurity and the BEND framework that you were part of developing. But before we get into these, could you take a step back and give our audience an overview of the information environment and how you currently perceive the challenges that we face as a society or maybe even the free world in general? Sure, so the information environment is extremely complex, you know, because it involves both the tabloids you see in the newspaper, your conversations with people around you, all the various social media platforms, Google, Wikipedia, you know, anything you can get online. And it is inundated and you are inundated by huge amount of information that is growing faster than we can count. Some of which is true, some of which is false, and it's coming from all over the world. Um, so today, because of things like the reduction in newspapers and particularly local, local newspapers, we often call them news deserts, um, the source and credibility of the information we're getting out there is no longer clear. It's no longer local. It spreads globally extremely fast. It gets amplified by things like bots and cyborgs, which aren't even people. And so it's difficult for us to think about what information is credible, to think about how it's getting spread, who is spreading it. And this is all made even more complicated by the fact that we're getting these new technologies almost every day that now can create content completely from scratch or that can create new images or can create films or videos. You know, the deep fakes are only a small part of that. And, and all of that means that it's faster to create content, it's faster to warp and change old content. But humans, you know, we're still just humans, right? We're still wired in the same old way. And we still have all these cognitive and social biases. And we still have a limit to how much information we can take in. So the way we perceive the environment and what we're taking out of it is still affected by our brains. And so it's become like this game almost in which what you're trying to affect is what people perceive and use people's own biases and cognition against them. Mm, all right. Yeah, that's uh, uh, we're overlaying all of this technology onto our brains, which are relatively unchanged or you know fixed uh, in this context. Yeah. Um, so, it in your piece, and we've got a link to this in the show notes. It's called "Social Cybersecurity and Emerging Science." Uh, you make a, a 
hard distinction between social cybersecurity and cognitive security. Could you illuminate this space just a little bit for us? Sure. So the distinction we often make is that um, cognitive security is really about the brain and AI. It's really about developing new uh, artificial intelligence techniques that are patterned to act like the way people think uh, so that they can, by acting more like people, the idea is they will be better able to detect threats and so on. And all of this, of course, is in contrast to cybersecurity, which is about hacking machines and data. Now, social cybersecurity is, in a sense, broader than cognitive security. It's really a new emerging scientific area that's computational, social science, and engineering. So it's focused on understanding, explaining, and reasoning about the you know, cyber media environment about, and about keeping people safe from safe so that they can operate, interact, get information without undue influence. And it's also about the engineering to build the tools, all, some of which involve AI, but not all. They also involve language technology, um, the real science of social networks, uh, anthropology, psychology, and social. In some sense, the two key differences between cognitive security and social cybersecurity is that cognitive security is really about the person and the person's brain in isolation. So it's like machine and person. Where social cybersecurity says, look, you know, people are not isolated, they're social beings. And because of that, a lot of what can be done in, in this area is affecting the world in which you live and, you, and the people you know, and using social influence and social processes as part of the whole campaign. So one, it's, it's individual versus the group. But the, and I think the other um, difference is that cognitive security almost gives the impression that AI is the answer, right? We can just make machines think like humans, we're gonna solve everything. Whereas I think in social cybersecurity, we recognize that yes, AI is important, but it's never going to solve everything. And that the real problems here are going to require both new policy, new technologies, not all of which are based in artificial intelligence, uh, different kinds of education and so on. So it's more complex. How does the concept of cybernetics fit into all of this? You know, like feedback loops that are constantly being intaked uh, into a network, it getting processed by the network, and then it feeds back into the network over and over again. It, it, is that a, a concept that's useful to understand? It's absolutely front and central, heart and core of the whole issue. Um, because, for example, a lot of the way things work, like um, if you're trying to amplify messages such as disinformation to get them to spread, you, you can't just send it out to a thousand people you want to send you want to get the message to you know the right thousand people so that they can then use their groups to spread it back and so it can go back to the originator and get adapted and change more and go bigger and bigger and bigger and all the, the new things we're seeing with conspiracy theories you know all have this kind of cyclical loops both at the individual level at the group level the world level to make them stronger and stronger over time Right. Uh, we didn't talk about this in advance, but can I get your hot take on another concept? And I, I may not quite have it right, but it's a concept, I, I believe it's called inactivism. It starts with an E. Um, and as I understand it, it is the notion that we interact with our environment and our environment interacts back with us and in a way we are like outsourcing to the world you know tools in order to help us navigate and understand you know how we should uh pursue our individual goals but then at a social cybersecurity level it's the environment that is engaging back with us I is this a concept that you're yeah, familiar yeah, yeah. with i mean and you know, it's definitely part of the cognitive part of social cybersecurity because um, where inactivism is basically looking at 
how you as an individual in your brain make sense of the world by interacting with it. Social cybersecurity says, yes, that's true. And the everyone else is doing the same thing. So you as a group make sense of the world by interacting with your group and with the cognitions of each of your others. So it's like an activism squared. It starts getting uh, mind warping pretty quickly. Um, all right. So, uh, uh, you know, back to the article that I referenced a few moments ago. The, so this is not a political podcast. Uh, however, sometimes it's helpful to draw upon current events in order to help connect the dots, so to speak. Uh, it might be helpful if you could review a case study or two, which which highlights the need for social cybersecurity and also sets up the follow on discussion about the Ben framework. Sure. So let me talk about the um, Reopen America campaigns. So um, this small little episode in American history. Um, so after everyone was on lockdown for a while, there started to be these idea that we should reopen back up, right? And there are a lot of these start, there were some very legitimate arguments and con concerns with people being out of work and, you know, not having money. And it's like, come on, no one around me is getting COVID. Why can't I sell things, right? But what happened was that these campaigns were in part enhanced and orchestrated inorganically. So long before the campaigns, which were in April, March and April, uh, you had lots and lots and lots of new accounts being set up, you know, in Reddit and in Twitter and so on. And these new accounts, um, maybe about two thirds, three quarters of them were on the pro reopen side. The others were on the anti reopen side and many, but not all of these were bots. And what these things do is they got into the information environment and then they started sending out messages. Now on the pro reopen side, these group of new accounts were very coordinated. They would message each other, they would message the same things and so on. On the anti reopen side, they were not nearly as coordinated. Okay, or they didn't appear to be as coordinated. Mm -hmm. So they would message lots of different things. They weren't talking to each other and so on. And through these groups and the messages that were sent, what happened is that over the course of like a month and a half, all these different individuals who for one reason or another thought, yeah, maybe it's time to reopen, were kind of brought in and linked together. And then they were linked into groups who were anti-face masks. And then they were linked to groups that were anti-vaccine. And this group became very cohesive it um, had received very consistent, constant messaging about the damage that the lockdown was causing. Um, and, you know, if you looked at the kind of um, uh, web pages they were going to and reading, they were talking about things like Breitbart, YouTube, Fox News, Facebook, and so on. It was very coherent and very cohesive. On the other side, what are all those new bots doing and the new, new accounts? Well, they're serving to decentralize the group, right? They're sending out very inconsistent messages. They're sending out confusion, you know, basically creating confusion. And despite the fact that on the anti-reopen side, you had a lot of verified actors, you had a lot of, you know, news agencies and so on, they responded in a very reactive, decentralized way. Um, and even though they were also pro masks and pro vaccines, they acted in a very non cohesive manner, in part because that's what was being forced out to them. So, these, this kind of activity kind of made it then led to people looking at these accounts and to these campaigns. And the campaigns, as opposed to being just occurring in Michigan and Virginia, before long then through the efforts of these bots and other things spread to almost every state, mm. you know? Yeah. yeah. And so they were, it was a very interesting campaign because they made it look like this was a huge movement when it wasn't really that big, but you know, with very specially crafted images and specially constructed dialogues and so on. So it used all the different forms of media we have at our disposal to create this kind of reopen. But the one interesting thing that they did from a media perspective, in addition, 
is that they transform the dialogue where initially it was all about, you know, reopen, you know, it's like, I, you know, I'm out of work, I need money, you know, I have legitimate concerns. Then they build and bridge these groups together and then they shifted a conversation, a rhetorical shift to talking about rights. And all of a sudden it became a political movement because now it was about, you know, how my rights don't stop, you know, when your fear starts and things like that. And the whole mask thing became a right not to wear a mask. And that was all kind of done through this kind of influence campaign in social media. So that's one example. Mm. And then another example, let me give you is more, uh, is still more current, which is the anti-vaccine example. Mm -hmm. So um, being pro and anti, the anti-vaccine movement, you know, is a worldwide movement. It, it predates COVID, you know, it predates the internet. There've always been people who don't want, didn't want vaccines for one reason or another. But what's happened during COVID is that as COVID first started, you know, in February of, you know, you know, January, February 2019, you already started seeing people going out and linking COVID to the anti-vax movement, preparing people so that if and when a vaccine came out from COVID, they wouldn't want it. And what's been happening over time is that a combination of bots and cyborgs and trolls, and a lot of it's been trolls, which are humans um, operating under a pseudonym and serving to try to disrupt or create um, dissension. And often by um, trashing people or being mean to people of a certain uh, persuasion or identity. So like, you know, anti-LGBTQT or anti, uh, or anti, there's a lot of anti-women trolls or, you know, mm. whatever. And so they already started things back then trying to link it to. But what's been happening is that they took a set of conspiracy theories and they started linking the vaccine into multiple different conspiracies. And then they started spreading it as part of that. So today, what you're seeing is, you know, first people were saying, well, I don't want to take the vaccine because when they give it to me, it's going to contain an RFID chip that will allow the government to control me, you know, through these new new towers they're putting up, 5G towers. Patently not true, the RFID tags, if there were, they were on the outside of the tubes, right? But people had got that concern because that was one of the conspiracy stories that were spread to them. Um, another one that and right now we have ones that are going on about how the CDC is lying, that the pandemic was orchestrated, that the vaccine itself causes infertility. And the thing about these is all of these stories don't become part of these bigger conspiracies, but they're spread online um, in very clever ways. So some of them will start because they might start in a state-sponsored media, media like China, China's, and then the bots will then propagate into the US, and then the US citizens themselves will pick it up and take it. That's one, So that's one way it comes in. But the other thing, how it comes in, it's very clever, is that they utilize things that are not really lies, but they're kind of misdirection, right? Like I hear that the CDC changed its policy on, you know, when to wear face masks. So everything we've been told is a lie. And all of a sudden it's, then it turns into the CDC is lying. So it's the it's very carefully marketed, orchestrated terms. And like I said, it's done through a set of Denzians, but throughout the whole anti-vax thing, it's that the vast majority of people are not necessarily reading or paying attention to it, but there's a smaller group that are and then that group can spread it to their local friends and relatives and, you know, people like them. And, and, and because they've tied it into so many political issues, it appears like a political issue now, too. Hmm. That is astonishing. And you, you mentioned that, there, I mean, there's a number of different ways that influence can enter into our discourse, everything from uh, deliberate marketing campaigns mm -hmm. that are paid for by, let's say, uh, a, a foreign actor on Facebook uh, to, well, you mentioned uh, you know, China might put out some kind of a news release that is not a, a paid advertisement, but it gets 
sucked up into the discourse yep. by by somebody bringing it in and then and then uh, amplifying it. Incredible. Uh, well, that leads me actually to the next thing I wanted to ask you about. So, you know, uh, the information operations, the, the opposite side of that coin, you can argue is is legal uh, advertising that companies mm -hmm. do, you know, they market their products. And so uh, that's a legal overt activity. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's not uncommon to see a, a new product by, you know, any marketplace participant, you know, they advertise on YouTube and on television, mm -hmm. maybe even in print on mm -hmm. Facebook. Anyway, it's multi-channel, right? Um, so information operations presumably is also a, a multi-channel uh, effort yeah. these days where these attack vectors are promulgated and choreographed across platforms and maybe even synchronized with political rhetoric. So mm -hmm. um, how do you and your colleagues grapple with that? You know, if it's a, if it's a commercial campaign for toothpaste, right? It's, it's obvious, you know, this is the toothpaste man manufacturer, they're marketing their product, they're, they're mm -hmm. trying to provide value in the network, it's, it, it's attributable. But these illegal influence campaigns are, you know, I mean, Russia is not announcing to us, you know, hey, we've got this campaign going, here's our goals. Uh, here, here's what to look out for. How, how do you guys sniff out these campaigns? across platforms? Yeah, so not as well as I want to is the short answer. Uh, but, uh, it, uh, this uh, this may yeah. be an active area of research, yeah. I guess. Right? It is very much an active area of research. Um, so one of the things that we've we tried to look at was where, where does the information, like what are the obvious links? Like if you get the tweets, do they reference a website? Do they reference a YouTube video? And what are the links there? And then we thought, so a whole bunch of them will reference YouTube videos. Then you go into YouTube and you say, okay, what are they linking to? And so one of the early things is we find that, of course, uh, tweets that reference YouTube videos tend to get retweeted more than others. And YouTube videos that are tweeted about get more hits on them. So any synergy between two or more platforms gets more hits to the information. Uh, and then besides those kind of active actual links, We've tried kind of looking as the same person on multiple platforms and you can find some, okay. Um, some people where they have to say, or they even give you their handles. Um, so you can find them, but often what's more telling is what are, when do you see the similar kind of hashtags or phrasings of things? And so we mm -hmm. also look for similar hashtags, similar phrasings. So, you know, how often do you see a phrase like uh, my body, my choice? Does, when does that phrase occur, which platforms and so on? And for a while, you know, we thought, well, everything obviously is going to start on Facebook or in web pages, and then it'll go to Twitter for amplification and so on. And what we're starting to see is that there's, it'll, it can start in, it can start anywhere and it goes back and forth. And so we're just trying to figure out when and where and how that's done. So it's, mm. it's um, I would say that it, there's increasing number of tools out there to try to help you do cross-platform identification, but it's still a, um, it's still not trivial. <laughs> right. right. So uh, presumably a lot of natural language processing technology, natural of, language understanding, uh, machine vision, and then some kind of like nearness statistical yeah, measures uh, in order yeah, to so knit things together. Yeah, so we use these uh, network statistics. So, you know, imagine you've got, you know, like a, uh, like a set of dots, right? And each of those dots represent a message or an idea, and they, and they, they link to the various platforms. And so you, you look at these kinds of networks, and based on network position, you can begin to say that these things are really coming from the same kind of actor or the same kind of thing. Yeah, wow, that is um, awesome stuff. So you and your colleagues have developed some pretty cool tools such as uh, Bot Hunter and Meme Hunter. Uh, and again, these are mentioned in the article that we've linked to. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about these capabilities? Sure, so Bot Hunter is actually a sequence of bot detection technologies that we've developed. 
that where you give it information, it works mainly on tweets. And it then says to what extent it believes that that sender of that message is a bot or not. And like any machine learning technique, it had to be trained. And, you know, it'll give you a score between zero and one. And if it's over a certain level, we say, yep, that appears to be a bot. Um, and it'll give a certain number of false positives. And false. Sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong, basically. Um, but the thing about our bot hunter technique is that um, it actually is really, really good when you have like a million tweets and you want to say, what fraction of these appear to be bots really fast? Because it can take historic data or, it, or whatever, and it can just, and it'll operate extremely fast, extremely quickly. Um, then we have a more advanced one that is a little more accurate, but it takes a lot longer. So like a million tweets on the one might take an hour. The other one might take, you know, three days. Hmm. But, you know, so it's, so it's kind of like, Computational trade-offs. It's a computational trade-off, right? Yeah. But um, what the other thing I would say about uh, the bot hunters is that bots are evolving so much that you have to keep retraining because they are changing a lot and they're different for different platforms. And there's nowhere near as many bots, say, on Facebook as there are on Twitter, as there, you know, so it changes by different platforms also. Now, Meme Hunter is... Uh, again, a machine learning technique. And one of the things that makes both Bot, Bot Hunter and Meme Hunter a little different than some of the other tools out there is that they take both some of the network position of the, of the, of the senders into account, but they also try to take uh, various kinds of content into account. Now, Meme Hunter is finding memes. These are like these images with words on them, right? So a lot of times there are talk, like a cat that says, how cute are cats underneath mm -hmm, it? Right? right, yeah. And so we built Meme Hunter to basically identify whether an image was a meme or not uh, that, was, that was in a thing. Because what we found is that with political discourse, memes were extremely frequently used. And they're often used in a very nuanced way. And that is, you'll get the same image, but then you'll see they'll just shift the wording on it, right? Hmm. So it'll go from, you know, Democrat to Republican to Democrat to Republican, or it'll go from pro-vax to anti-vax by just subtle shiftings of the word. So you'll get these debates back by simply looking at memes that are kind of similar, but with slightly different words. Mm, that's interesting stuff. Uh, can I ask you a, a follow-up, but probably relevant to both of those hunters, but mm -hmm. especially the bot hunter. And so when, when you're describing the uh, challenges, um, uh, I think of uh, like patterns of life and that uh, the, the way bots would present themselves a year ago or three years ago, or even last month uh, is changing and evolving. And so you've got like this kind of like a sliding window of, of analysis where uh, yesterday's model doesn't work as well on today's activity. Is, is that a, a problem that you guys are tackling as well? Um, yes, but yes and yes. <laughs> yes, we are tackling it. Yeah, yes, it's yeah. kind of like that. But I will say that the old kind of bots are still out there too. Mm. So it's not that they, it's not like it's technology where everybody said, oh, you know, I wanted to say, oh, now I want an electric car. Oh, now I want a self-drive car. It's not like all, it's like everything is there kind of co-present. It's just which ones are used for which kind of activity changes. And new, and new, and new ones keep getting new in. New TTPs yeah. are being yeah. uh, introduced into the, the yeah. marketplace, if you will, uh, right. continually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. What a, what a challenge. Um, okay. So now I, I guess I'd like to ask you if maybe you can start putting this together. And so you, you developed the BEND framework, uh, B-E-N-D. Uh, and that's an acronym, acronym in order to address some of these challenges, at least the way I understand it. Could you please describe this framework and um, also maybe talk about you know, what types of organizations uh, do you think should be examining and adopting these kinds of tools? Okay. So the Ben framework tries to look at information maneuvers in terms of who is doing what to whom with what impact. So for the who is doing what, uh, 
is we're talking about things like is this not was it joe doing it but is it a bot or is it a troll or is it a cyborg mm -hmm. you know or is it a verified account or a news agency so it's all these technologies all these hunters first to say what kind of actor is it who's sending it and then the what are they doing part is where the ben comes in and that literally stands for uh 16 different maneuvers like things like um trying to excite people with your message or trying to create dismay or trying to build a group where there was none or try uh, trying to destroy a group where there was one so it, so they're both maneuvers that are aimed at changing what is being said or how it is being said as well as maneuvers that are aimed at changing who is talking to whom and who are the leaders of those groups and then the to whom is are these being directed at specific individuals so like in the reopen campaign many of the democratic governors had backing maneuvers done to support them at first and then their backers turned into creating dismay about that governor so that people quit that to try to reduce trust in them for mm. example mm. and uh then we have with what impact what we're trying to do is get beyond saying you know the thing that we love in communication which is reach like how many people read my post to being able to say well what did it do did it increase or decrease echo chamberness did it create mass hysteria did you know so we're trying to create measures of impact that are at that more kind of group level so mm -hmm. that's kind of what the whole band framework is about and in terms of who should use it clearly there's a national security need here um as in you know whether it's nato or whether it's strat or whether it's our own forces or whatever you know they want to get beyond analyzing the world in terms of kind of finding the magic tweet of the day or the magic youtube post and send it consistently is what is it that the adversary's trying to do and therefore how should we kind of counter that so you get their playbooks laid out more in terms of these maneuvers rather than what i dreamed up last last night kind of things uh, at the corporate level it's also extremely useful and in fact i usually argue that every company out there should invest in having a social cybersecurity team hmm. that tries to maintain their brand maintain their image you know and builds a community around them of people who will support and you know support their image and that they can support and support their news that that because creating that trusted community around you is one of the ways of keeping your airspace a little bit clear of uh, disinformation finally i would say it's also applicable at the individual level in fact we just did this thing where we talked about bend and you where we were talking to individual people about okay you send out this post you think it's doing that well here's how it's being interpreted by other people or here's what maneuvers are being in your airspace that you're seeing that are trying to affect you yourself trying to paraphrase here uh probably not doing it justice but it sounds like the bend framework is a way of uh, establishing situational awareness and also uh, heading towards being able to measure uh, efficacy or you know measure impact of campaigns. Would both those things? Would you say that that's fair? Yes, I do. Yeah. Could the Ben framework also be on the other side of the coin again? Be a uh, a, a tool for legal marketing campaign efficacy measurement. As absolutely well. absolutely in fact yeah. anything so, in the so it's 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 dual use i guess yes. to use yes. the uh lingo in uh you know some of the national security r d uh yeah that that is that is really cool i'd like to uh start wrapping up if i may we've talked about this just a little bit but what are some of your current uh, research efforts and uh, that that you and your colleagues are doing that you're excited about and what are some of the other challenges that you guys are tackling? Well, one of our current challenge things that we're working on is trying to improve the Ben metrics to take into account behavior over time. So we're you know next generation kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we've been working on is linking in. Um, 
ways of measuring and thinking about hate speech in this environment, because disinformation and hate speech, uh, extremism, they're also inexorably linked when you're in an online environment that we're trying to uh, get better at detecting trolls and hate speech and coming up with, and then the third project, a third project is working on counter maneuvers. That is, if someone is doing this to you or your company or whatever, how should you respond? Or what, what is an effective response? Mm, that's all, all really interesting stuff. Could you offer to our audience a, a, a book or maybe an online resource that they might not know about, which touches upon some of these things? So I would, so I'm, I'm not gonna offer a book, but I will say that our, um, the ideas website and the cases website have uh, publications on them. And I would definitely go to there, but I would also go to the social cybersecurity working groups website as well, because all of those, um, you'll be able to get lots of information. Yeah, or they can reach out to me and I can be more directive. Professor Kathleen Carley, thank you so much for being on the Cognitive Crucible. My pleasure and thanks for having me, this is fun. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.